the Lord. I just want to say praise God. To all the fathers, God bless you. I just want to say, if you didn't have a good father at home with you, don't worry about that. Because you're on the Lord's side now. And he is the best father that we could ever have. He's a good example. And that God loves us even despite sometimes of our mistakes. And as a father, you know, sometimes we're not always there all the time for our children. But you know, God looks beyond that. And he sees what you are today. And I just want to encourage the fathers, be encouraged. Thank God that you are a dad. And maybe sometimes we're not the best dad. But with God's help, you can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. I just want to let you know that God loves you and no matter of the mistakes that we make, he looks beyond that. So we shouldn't beat ourselves up because I, don't, I feel like I ain't spending enough time with my kids. God knows. And all you can do is take today and do the best that you can do with the help of the Lord. So just be encouraged. Hold your head up. We don't have nothing to hold our heads down for. You're on the Lord's side now. So just be encouraged. You know, I think about the scripture in Joshua that when Moses uh, was getting ready to, or, or Moses had went on and he was talking to Joshua and telling Joshua, as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. That I'll never leave you or forsake you. Don't get discouraged. Don't be dismayed. Don't even get fearful. Know that I am with you. And God is with you today. Lord, I didn't do too good today, but Lord, help me. Help me throughout this day that I'll be the best dad that I can be. He is our example. All we got to do is read the word and he'll show us how to be a good dad. I just encourage you today to hold your head up if, you, if it's been a while since you heard from your dad, give him a call and just say, Dad, I love you. And I just want to say, Happy Father's Day. And we always have, God always leads us to someone that can be a father image to us besides him, an earthly dad. So I just want to say to my husband, thank you for being not only my husband, but being a dad to my children or our children. Sometimes I do say mine. <laughs> but I thank you for being the dad that you are. And don't, you know, beat yourself up sometime. Sometimes when we don't have a close relationship with our, our earthly dad, we beat ourselves up that we're not the dad that, you know, I didn't have the example. But as long as we have God on our side, he's the best example we can have. So fathers, hold your head. what you say and be the best dad today you know don't look on to yesterday but look at today and be the best dad that you can be god bless you and be encouraged i'm so nervous i'm really nervous i is nervous Whew. happy father's day but i wanted to put it this way and she's good because she ain't got paper I got paper because I know how to get discombobulated and go somewhere else so I had to make put this together and here's what was put on my heart and whoo I'm nervous <laughs> happy God's day happy Jesus day happy Holy Spirit day hallelujah and happy Father's Day to all men. Hallelujah. In the beginning, God. Hallelujah. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now I'm going to get kind of personal. I got my Kleenex. But. I got 
four more minutes. Now I can't see. <laughs> okay. When I grew up, I had a father, but I didn't have a father in the home. Amen. But I had some strong women in my life. Hallelujah. But no man. But I knew there had to be a man somewhere. There's nine of us. Amen. <laughs> Mama was doing something. <laughs> I was 30 years old before I heard about Jesus. And when I figured out I had a father, I can't tell you, but I never looked for one. I never looked for a father, father image in our home because we had some strong women and they were women, but they could, they could fight. They were like men. So we didn't need no man. I had an auntie that carried a knife in her sock. Hallelujah. <laughs> I had one that would jump on the table at the club and cut your throat. See, I grew up with some strong women. <laughs> As I come, I have to watch me. But I never looked for a man. So I never had a mindset that I didn't have it together. But today, as I grow in the Lord, I know that I have a father. I never had one present, but I'm telling you, when I found out that God was my daddy, I didn't have to look no more. In fact, I, what I did find out, I believe he was my daddy because me and Don looked like him. He cut his phone number off. So we wouldn't get in touch, didn't he? Okay. But today, fathers, fathers, don't worry about how your father reacted. Don't worry about how he talked to you. Don't worry about you didn't get what you think you should have had. You are now a father. If you're not a father, you're a man. Hallelujah. You are a man. Women, stop saying I'm the mama and the daddy. You, the baby's got a daddy somewhere. He might not be in the house, but he got a daddy. And women, we got to start respecting our men. Respecting them because let me tell you, Kimberly, Stephanie, Stan, and Charles, they know they had a daddy, but that's their daddy. That's their daddy now. I don't call him a stepdaddy. I call him, he's their daddy. 43 years, he's a daddy. That's daddy. And women, stop saying stepfathers. Say father. Drop that step. Hallelujah. I was blessed to find out. That God was my father. I went through years not fretting. I didn't fret because I didn't have a daddy in the house. I was a happy person and I'm still happy. But I thank God, hallelujah, I know a man from a woman. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Not many have experienced what I've experienced. I ain't been cussed out by no man. I ain't been beat down by... I wish he would put his hands on me. But I ain't be, been beat down by no man or my mama. My mama whipped us, but she didn't beat us. I'm still alive. Uh-uh, Joan ain't beating on me. Stop playing. I remember one time when he looked at me and I was like, come near me if you want to. <laughs> I was a rough little sister. Okay? Hey, hey, hey! Stop acting like y'all don't know. 
Uh oh, I only got two seconds. Not many has ever experienced that men, brothers, and fathers with a father or not. No, he may not be like you want him to be like. No, he might not act like you want him to act because I got ahead of myself. But, <laughs> but how are you doing? Check it out, check it out, check it out. <laughs> with your responsibility as a daddy. Are you doing what you should be doing as a father? Fathers. See, you don't have to be around your children. You write a note, write a letter, send a card, text, something, just to say, how you doing? Wives, they the daddies of these children. Just like my children, I don't say that's they stepdaddy. No, we all in the same house. And we're going to act like a family. See, when you separate step Fathers and fathers, you ain't a family. You, you, you got to learn how to make a family. Amen. So how are you doing, fathers? All you have to do is read the word and find out what your father above, has, how he's acting, how he's talking. How to be like God. Fathers, God bless you. Praise the Lord. They said they're nervous. That's nothing compared to how I feel <laughs> right now. But um, first of all, happy Father's Day to all the men out there. Um, I'm going to try to be very quick. But um, the title of my message today is called To Know God is to Come into the Full Revelation of Who You Are. And as I was thinking about what it means to be a good dad, um, I remember it was Mother's Day, my mom was saying, when she was talking about my grandma, that to be a good mom, you first have to be a good woman. And I think that that same idea applies to being a good dad. To be a good dad, you first have to be a good man. But what makes a good man? If you're in the church and you follow God, you're gonna have to be a godly example which means that you have to go by God's definition of what it means to be a man. The issue is that nowadays, as a church as a whole, we sometimes define ourselves by the wrong things. So this can be things of the world or things that happen to your past, but that's not what God sees in you. So today I'm just basically gonna deal with how having a relationship with God um, will really show you who you really are. So when you become, I guess, the man or the woman that God wants you to be, you can then be a good mom, a good sister, uh, you know, whatever else God has for you. So the first point um, that I want to make when it comes to relationship is just to become aware of distractions. Um, I'm going to turn really quick, and if you want, you can. Um, I'm going to turn to Genesis chapter 3, verses... 7 through 10. Um, we've been over this scripture a lot, but I just want to note that distractions often lead to an act of disobedience, and an act of disobedience can often lead to bad consequences. And in the garden, you see that Adam and Eve were constantly in God's presence. They were talking with God on a daily basis until the serpent came into the picture. And as we all know, they ate the act, well, it was a fruit, I don't know which fruit it was. But they ate the fruit and their eyes became open. So starting at verse seven it says, then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made covering for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And this is one of the greatest things, I think, when it comes to distractions. They often lead you away from God. So I thought about one example. I can't tell the whole story on the top of my head. But it's basically when Peter was walking on water, and as long as he had his eyes on Jesus, he was good. 
but it wasn't until he got distracted by the things that were going on around him that he began to sink. And it can be the same way with fathers or just, you know, women too. When we are distracted by, it can be anything. It can be work, um, another person getting in the way. Whatever takes you away from God, it'll cause you to sink in your life. So God is saying that it's really time to seek his face. Because as long as we can focus on him and hear from him, we'll be good. And I think... Um, this was a really big deal for dads because I know in today's society there's often this stereotype of a man isn't supposed to um, show his emotions or keep everything in, but that's not how God made man to be. If you're not going to open up to anybody else, make sure that you open up yourself to God. To God. So, and the other thing that I wanted to know, we kind of talked about this um, in Sunday school today is if you notice Adam and Eve sowed fig leaves for themselves and then they tried to hide from God and this is another thing that he wants us as a church to stop doing sowing fig leaves that can be trying to do things or carry things on your own when you try to do things on your own you're saying to God that I don't need you anymore but if you're going but to be a godly man or woman, you need God as your foundation. So, yeah. So the second key point that when it comes to having a relationship with God, the enemy is the one who will always throw distractions in your way. And you have to know who the real enemy is. To, to be able to, I guess, avoid distractions, you're gonna have to know your enemy, what his strategy is, so you can defeat him. The enemy comes to steal your identity, kill your dreams, and destroy the plans that God has destined for you. So you can read Genesis 1 and 2, but we see that God made man in his own image, and he was constantly talking with him. And the devil saw how valuable man just was, that the Lord was willing to breathe the breath of life into the man. So the devil knew, and it says in the beginning of chapter 3, the serpent was more crafty. So he knew if I can throw a distraction your way, you'll try to hide from God, and then I can really blind you to who you are. And if you look in today's society, unfortunately, you see a lot of fatherless families, men who aren't really taking care of themselves. That can go for women too. But that it's because they're in the dark and they don't realize who the real enemy is. You can also think of issues in the family or in your marriage. You're yelling at the kids or the wife or the husband, but you fail to realize you need to pray because your real enemy is the devil. And he'll try to hide and seem like he's not there, but he is. So when you know who your enemy is, that'll help you avoid distractions and stay close to God. Um, last but not least, the last point I want to make is just to encourage you all to really press on and seek God's face and really, again, um, just make him your foundation. Um, we kind of talked about this in Sunday school, too, but I'm going to be reading from Philippians 3, uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and read. Um, starting at verse 10, it says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So, um, with verses 10 through 11, to me, I see that as Paul saying, I want to know, I want to know God, I want to choose God, I want him to be in my life, I want to understand why, you know, I was worthy to him for him to die and give up his only life. I want to find out what this is about. And if you recall in the Last Supper, Jesus told his disciples, if you don't eat the bread, 
and you know drink the wine which represented his blood you have no part of me so to, be, to become a part of Christ we do have to die daily for his will his purpose his plan that he has for our life to really um, to really um, grow um, and then in verse 12 to 14, I really like how Paul was saying, not that I have already obtained all this, are already been made perfect. So we talked about that in Sunday school too. Of um, Maybe I'm not who I want to be, but I'm not who I used to be. And this is why I also want to tell the men, you know, and ladies here, don't be distracted or don't constantly define yourself by your past. Maybe you didn't have a dad maybe you didn't have a family that loved you, maybe you did all horrible things in the past, but if God is working in you, don't let the devil throw those things in the way and say, you're never going to be this, or you're never going to be that. If God has placed potential in you, then who is the enemy who's been defeated at Calvary to try to take that away from you? So you really have to press on to see the high calling that God has for you. And that's, again, why relationship is so important. It's such a personal thing for you. And um, I really found it interesting that there are a lot of men in the Bible who show, um, I guess, how your relationship with God will say a lot about your character. Abraham, for example, as we know, had his name changed from Abram to Abraham. And God called him to be the father of many nations. And based on his relationship with God, his character, he's known today as the friend of God. The only way he could have been a friend of God is if he talked with God and had a relationship with him. Moses um, had an encounter with God at the burning bush, and from there he received his calling from God. So again, you're never going to see your calling unless, you know, you talk with God. Only he can reveal it to you. And um, as we know, the Lord spoke with Moses face to face like a man speaks to his friend. And I think... Um, in Exodus 34, verses 29 to 35, it says that Moses' face was radiant from the time he spent speaking with the Lord. So the time you spend with God, the more you know you talk with God, it's going to show to everybody. People know the light when they see it. David, having a heart that wanted to serve the Lord, was known as the man after God's own heart. So when you spend time with the Lord, you're going to mimic his ways. Joseph, the father of Jesus, was a righteous man, and because he had a relationship with God, he was able to heed to the voice of the Lord concerning the appropriate time it was for him, Mary, and Jesus to travel to Egypt when it was time to leave, what even to name the baby. Now, if you think about this for a moment, if Joseph didn't know the Lord, how would he have known that it was an angel trying to warn him? Again, you have to know the Lord. It's almost like when a baby's born, I'm not in psychology, but I just heard about this. When a baby's born, they recognize their parents' voice. And as is children, it has to be the same thing for us. So again, I just wanna, in conclusion, encourage you all to really have a relationship with him because it is gonna say a lot about your character as a man and as a woman. And when you're able to be the best man or woman that you can be, then you'll be able to be the father, the mother, the sister, whatever it is that God has for you. So I just want to encourage you all to really seek the Lord's face. And I wish all the men here a happy Father's Day. Let's have our Sister Charity. I want Sister Charity, uh, Sister Marilyn, and Donna to just stand up one more time. Amen. Let's give them another hand praise on this morning. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I, I, you know, I, I love y'all, but I want to focus over here for just a minute. Because I don't think I've ever heard her say three words. But I, but I want to thank you. Amen. Thank you very much for, for today. Amen. Amen. Now, I, I am going to be real brief today because we hadn't really planned this, but I told Bonnie that I'd be her ram in the bush at 1230. So it's 12.30, so I, I just got 11 points I want to give you this morning. <laughs> no, the, the first thing, a, a real man, everybody say a real man. Real man. It, it's okay to be a male. 
All you got to do is be born one. But as you've heard this morning, but the thing is knowing the purpose of a father. The first statement I want to make you this morning is that if you don't know the purpose of a thing, abuse is inevitable. If you don't know the purpose of a thing, abuse is inevitable. And most men, now there, there are some iniquities that roll around in, the, in this whole thing. For instance, black men uh, during slavery were only uh, uh, supposed to produce, lead their families, boom. Okay, everybody, you, you're aware of that, right? So, so it becomes real easy now for men to walk out on their families because it's an, it's an iniquity, okay? And they were never taught how to be a father. Now, I'm not pulling a race card this morning, but that's just part of what being a father is all about. Because if you don't know the reason of a father or for a father, you can't be one. Because even in today's society, and thank you again, Charity, in today's society, you got a lot of men having babies, but it doesn't make them a daddy. That's why it's so easy for them to leave. I, I hear Urban say all the time, if you're a resident here at Restoration and you got kids and, you, and you're a father, uh, he the daddy. Everybody said, that's tight. Yeah, but it's right. You're supposed to be taking care of your own kids. Now, no, things happen. Things happen. But what we're talking about is responsibility. Got to have some responsibility. So the first thing I want to tell you this morning, a real man honors his marriage, his family, and puts that above his personal interests. It's tight, but it's right. You got to honor your family. Most men, when you come in, everybody says selfishness. Man, it's the biggest fleshly thorn in your side is to get rid of being selfish. Because you, you can no longer be thinking about you. Your family and your kids come before you. slow rain. And how, how many men in here know that that's not a real easy thing to learn in the beginning? You might know it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know what you mean, brother. I know it, but it was, it was difficult for me to do. Difficult. But as you grow and as you learn, you learn to put yourself last. But in putting yourself last, there's a couple other things that comes into play. What do you want to leave your wife and your children with? Okay? Now, I know monetarily and, and materially, you know, they, they wishing you leave them a million dollars. But let me tell you something. The best thing you can leave your family is faith. Throughout the Bible, there's this phrase... And he worshiped the God of his fathers. And he worshiped the God of his fathers. Which means that the legacy that he's left, that he left, or that the fathers left, was that you can trust God. When you get into a tight spot, don't look to your neighbor, trust God. Your kids have to see you walking upright and trusting God in difficult times. Everybody say tough times. <laughs> see, they can't see you cussing their mom out when you're doing a tough time. You, how many know you got smart children? How many fathers? Let me go fathers, not, not women. Y'all had y'all day last the other week. How many men know that your kids are smart? And they just like little tape recorders. They do what they have seen done. If you want to know how come, now this might not apply, this ain't a general application, but you'll find that most abusers came from abusive homes. They saw somebody put their hands on somebody. And they thought that that was the way that situations were handled. Amen, somebody. So all the men, just throw your hands up. Hands up. 
Yeah, that's what you ought to do. Because I, I, just, I just arrested you. I just arrested you. So when you want to put your hands on a woman, hands up. <laughs> hands up. Because I, I, I mean, now, you, you heard my wife talk about, you know, because there are many days I wanted to put my hands on her. And then, then act like I was on Ambien or something, you know, like. <laughs> See, so if y'all don't know about Ambien, you, know, you, you don't know what I'm talking about. Ambien is that kind of stuff that make you go drive your car to Chicago, come back and say, did I leave? <laughs> so there's been many times, you know, I wanted, I wanted to do it, but I had to honor her. The Bible says, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. And I don't personally like to get whipped. Okay, let, let me skip that one. Okay, so the, the second thing is, you must love the mother of your children. You must love the mother of your children. Your children will learn to love how they see you love somebody. I, I grew up in a household, and, and during the, the time that I was growing up, I never saw my mom and dad kiss and hug. I'm old school. And I know what they were doing. But man, do you realize how that affected me? It affected me this way. When we would walk in the mall, Donna would want to hold my hand. I'd go. I go. Did, I didn't grow up like that. I thought that that was, a, that was almost X-rated, you know, to be out in public holding hands and kissing and stuff. But I had to learn to do that. I had to put what I didn't want to do above what I had to do or what I wanted to do. So I, ha I had to learn that kind of thing. Now, number three, a father loves his children. A father loves his children. Now we can get overbalanced with this thing because a lot of times we'll give them what they want instead of what they need. Because, uh, say this with me, I can't have a do-over. Just because you had a bad childhood, now you're going to try to make up by giving your child everything and anything that they want and some things they don't need. So you got to give them what they need and not what they want. What's up, brother? <laughs> yeah, because sometimes, you know, children actually want discipline. But you've already made up in your mind, my mama didn't whip me, so I'm not going I'm not gonna have any physical discipline with my children. The Bible says beat them, they will not die. All the kids say, hey. Beat them, they will not die. So if you got some little kids in here and you've already made, you had them, you, you've already said you would never, I would never whip my children. Now whip, let me take that out of, I will never discipline my children. You, you went for a rough road. Because the Bible says that a rod will drive foolishness out of a child. Hallelujah. The fourth thing a father is responsible for his children. Responsible. Let me, let, me, let me break that down a little bit for you. You got to figure out who they be around. A father loves his children, number three. Number four is responsible for his children. And when, when we talk about responsibility, let, let me just speak to the fathers and then the A points for the kids. Children do not have rights. There have been recent cases where children have sued their parents to get a divorce from their parents. What kind of nonsense is that? Hey man, it's from the pit of hell. Like children have right, well I don't like the way you're raising me so I'm going to divorce myself from you. Man, you ain't got no rights. I used to tell mine, when you start paying some of these bills around here, you still ain't got no rights. <laughs> hey, hey, man, 
somebody. See, and most of the time, children will tell you. I, I remember episodes now. My daughter, she just walked out the room. I'm glad she walked out. I remember one time when, when we were, when, when my kids was growing up, they had just got to be teenagers. I think maybe 17. Stephanie was about 17. And we used to have family meetings. Way back then, we, we knew that we had sense up to have family meetings. And I remember Stephanie said, how much money do you make? Sort of caught me by, caught me off guard. I said, what you saying? She said, I won't know how come, because see, if they work, they had to put some money in the kitty. That was just part of their responsibility. They was working, you know, out of school or getting ready to get out of school. No, you're going to put some money over, give it to your mama because she's doing your laundry and she's cooking. She's doing all that. You put some money in the pot. Well, they got tired of giving me money or giving us money. So, they, you know, they want to quit. How much money you make? What? Man, I had to put my hands in my pocket because I wanted to reach out and grab something. What do you mean, how much money? Yeah, y'all want all our money. I want to know how much money you make. You're supposed to be taking care of us. <laughs> so I said, Donna, take the flow. <clears throat> yeah, and I had to write one because she had no holes barred, no holes barred. Well, because she's the same one that used to take Stephanie to the top of the steps. Oh, that was Stan. Well, I thought it was Stephanie. It was Stephanie, too. Yeah. Taking him up to the top of the steps and said, I can't whoop you, but I'll push you down the steps. <laughs> and let me tell y'all something. See, that might sound a little ancient, but they got more respect for her today than you will ever know. And didn't really have to really lay a hand. I mean, it's might have threatened to push me down the steps, you know. There were 14 steps on Park Street. And I know, Lindell, you probably counted every last one of them. <laughs> but see, how, how you raise them, you got to remember again, they don't have rights. You make the rules. You make the rules. And most of them grow up, again, thinking they got rights. Well, when I get 18, I can't leave. Well, let's see if we can't get in a time machine and speed that up for you. Because you don't run nothing here. A part of that, too, is also guard who your children are around. It's your responsibility to guard who your children are around. Because they can pick up stuff. They're picking up enough at home. Let alone what they'll pick when they're outside the home. So you become a guardian of what they hear and what they see. You know, I see some parents, you know, we got some uh, real close friends. And they like watching scary movies. And they're the first ones to come over to the house. My, my children are having nightmares. <laughs> oh, as Nick said, I'm your worst nightmare. <laughs> well, there's a reason why they had nightmares. Because you're feeding that into their spirit. And you, you're raising a Chucky. Y'all know who Chucky is, right? Yeah. You're raising a Chucky, so that's why you got to sleep with one eye open. And you won't know how come you can't sleep. Okay. <laughs> Number five, listen. Teaches and instructs his children. Well, don't worry about the number. You're going to get them all sooner or later. Teaches and instructs his children. The Bible is always talking about training. And training is going to entail teaching and instructing. You don't give them a task and then expect them to do it without instructing them and training them into how to do it. Because most fathers never gave instructions. They just expected it to be done. And then when it wasn't done the way they wanted it done... They never understood that they never trained them to do it right. Most of the time, it was yelling and screaming. I mean, I didn't even know my own name till I was about 12. I 
I'm, I'm not going to tell you what my name was. <laughs> you little blank, blank. So, so look, when I got to school and they called my name, I went, that ain't my name. <laughs> but a, a father teaches and instructs his children. The next one is a father trains and disciplines his children. There's a difference between all of those. There's a difference between teaching and instructing and training and discipline. Somehow we've got this thing all lumped into one. And we think it's all one thing. And it's not all one thing. The Bible always talks about children. Son, attend to the instructions of your father. Instructions. But here's the thing. If a father does not know how to instruct, it's impossible for him to pass down instructions. Because we're already behind the eight ball in not knowing how to be a father. Because most of us were never taught how to be fathers. And if it was, it came from, came from a dysfunctional kind of attitude. Yelling and screaming and threatening and provoking and, and those kinds of things does not make a child, a male child especially, a good father. Everybody say redo. redo. But see, after you get old enough, you can always redo. I, I remember when my, when my dad, you know, he was a disciplinarian. And some of you who have been around long enough, you already know my story. But I remember when I was uh, 18, just turned 18, and my father said uh, he was a real disciplinarian. Matter of fact, I was scared of him really afraid and he told me when you go and I was working and he said when you go to work and you can when you can come home and not give your mother any money and I remember I'm going to kill you you know at the time you know, I, I took it lightly but until the weekend I went and spent all my money and I was catching the bus home and I remember thinking on the bus he gonna kill me. <laughs> so as I came in, the, in 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 my house in the front door, my my mother was sitting here and my sisters and brothers were sitting on a couch and they just all looked at me and I'm saying, oh my God, he is gonna kill me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like they would give me my last rites and testimonies right then. But as I walked, I remember he was sitting in a chair right here and I walked through the door and I stood beside him and he looked up at me and I fainted <laughs> true story I fainted if, if your strength is in the day of adversity if you faint your strength is small I'm pretty sure that's why that scripture means so much to me I'm honest he looked he didn't have to say a word I looked up and I just fainted and when I got up, I just got up and went and joined the military. <laughs> because he was straight, man, he was straight up fear. He wasn't a big man, but you just knew he meant what he said. And I felt, you know, and he had little weird ways of disciplining. But, but, you know, and I found myself and my kids disciplining them the same way he did. <laughs> See, my boys aren't here, but, you know, I never disciplined the girls except for screaming at them. But, but the boys, I had a big, um, anybody remember those encyclopedias? One about this big. I'd make, them, I'd make them hold it up in the air like that. And make them turn to the corner, turn, get away, just turn and hold it up. And they'd hold it up. And, you know, after they'd grown, they'd say, Pop, let me tell you something. I wish you just had a whoop me. <laughs> because they couldn't, you know, after you put, you hold it up for so long, you can't get your arms back up after, you can't get your arms down after you hold that big book. So they was walking around like this, even after the book was gone. And, I, and I'm laughing, but my son today does the same thing. Everybody say, break the cycle. So see, if I, because I didn't know what I was doing, he picked up on what I didn't know anything about, and now he's perpetuating the whole thing. So sometimes you need to switch it up 
and do the right thing. Here's the thing. Unless you know God's way of doing it, you will eventually do it wrong. So you got to know how God wants you to raise your children. And all children are not the same. If you have four kids and you blanketly try to discipline and train and instruct and treat them the same way, you're in for a rude awakening. Because each child has a personality that you must address. And most of us feed into this because how many men in here have said you act just like your mama? I'm, I'm looking over to my left because <laughs> uh, most of my people over here, <laughs> and I know what they say, you know, because they tell Stephanie she acts just like her mama. So me and Lindell have a lot of private conversations. <laughs> and I try to give him a head up. This wasn't going to happen, dude. <laughs> if, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Because you're going to have some days like that. Okay, no, number seven. Here, here, this is a big one. Fathers need to encourage their children. If they don't get encouragement anywhere else, they need to get it from the male figure in their home. Donna alluded to it, but women have no idea what it's like to be a man. Book sense, you can read you can read every book that's ever been written, you still don't know how to be a man. So if you don't know how to be a man, it's gonna be kind of hard to instruct, especially male children, because they are the progenitors of the race. So you need to teach them so they can take their rightful place now in being the fathers that God has called them to be. Fatherhood does not come with but one booklet. The Bible. And then you really have to search because there are a lot of dysfunctional families in the Bible. Matter of fact, there are not very many functional families in the Bible. Anybody remember David? All, all David's kids was hoes. They all dealt with sexual immorality. Solomon, supposed to be the wisest man in the Bible, had a woman problem. I said he was the wisest man that ever lived and he had a woman problem. Y'all still didn't get it. I said he was the wisest man and he had a woman problem. Which says that seasonally, some women are smarter than you. Now this is a this is a Mother's Day thing, but sometimes men, you need to listen to your wives. Now, I ain't talking about they tell you, let's go rob a bank. No, I ain't following you now. But I'm just talking about in everyday things, you need to listen to your wife. Why? Because the Bible says she is your help meet. She's there to help you meet. Help you meet the destiny of your home. Amen, somebody. Amen. And see, most men are so selfish and prideful and conceited. Come on, I'm, I'm just calling it like I see it, because see, I, I'm one. See, I, I'm one. And I know how prideful and conceited, that's why the scripture, deny yourself, has become a bugaboo in my spirit. Because I understand how prideful I can be. And most men in here know exactly what I'm talking about. Even if you ain't saying it, you're thinking it. I'm going to say it again. Even if you ain't, you might be scared to say it, but you're thinking it. A whole lot of stuff you want to say, but you had, you use godly wisdom. And don't, don't say, everybody say this, don't say, don't say everything, everything that's on your mind. 
It's worked for me for 45 years. I have gone to my prayer closet telling God what I was thinking that I would not dare say in front of anybody else. I, 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 because we have developed this whole Adam and Eve syndrome. Remember when Adam and Eve fell or when Eve fell in the garden? The first thing she did was what? She blamed. No, she blamed the serpent. Adam blamed Eve. He said, it was the woman you gave me. And I don't know how many times, even in a teaching thing, I've used that. It was the woman you gave me. How come you didn't do what I told you? Because the, the woman you gave me, she was getting on my nerves. And, and because she was getting on my nerves, I, I, I decided to do what I wanted to do. And, and see, it was the woman you gave me. And we do it all the time. Number eight, that last was, was encourages his children. Number eight was this, he comforts his children. A father comforts his children. I, I don't know how many have a close bond with your, with your children, but there's one thing to have open communication, and, and see, I'm not talking about children rights. I'm talking about an avenue of communication where your child is not embarrassed to talk to you. I learned most of the stuff I learned in the locker room in the barbershop. Never had to talk about no birds and the bees. Uh, I mean, real birds and bees, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, sex and stuff like that. Man, my, my, my father never sat me down. Matter of fact, I had room as soon as I was of age. I could do anything I wanted to. I could stay out as late as I wanted to, do whatever I wanted to. That was a different thing for my sisters. But I'm, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm giving you is the societal differences in men and women and what they become later on. And all those things worked at men. It worked against me. And I had to relearn a whole lot of stuff because I didn't know what a father was supposed to do. And you all, Don already shared, I, I, I had a microwave family. Why? It was true. One day I didn't have one. Next day I had four. You can't get no more microwave than that. One minute, doop. <laughs> but see, you, you have to realize something. God knew my yesterday, the day before. So see, I'm, I'm, I was made to handle this. And, and I would venture to say that my children are better off because I was in their life. I mean, that's the way you got you to gotta look at this thing. Is God already knew what he wanted in my life. So he scripted all this stuff together. And then he put me somewhere that most of the time I didn't want to be. But I understood the purpose for me being there. And you listen to this. You can't run away from purpose. So no matter how much you want them people who want to leave, you can't run away from purpose. That's right. That's right. You got to look at this thing as being ordained by God. Yeah. 